ladies and gentlemen. I think you must have had a great dinner because you're all chatty, which is a good thing. That was the whole goal of mixing you up. It's now my distinct pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for this evening. Thomas Ridd is professor of strategic studies at John Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. Dr. Ridd's most recent book, The Rise of the Machines, tells the sweeping story of how cybernetics, a late 1940s theory of machines, came to incite anarchy and war. His 2015 article in the Journal of Strategic Studies attributing cyber attacks was designed to explain, guide, and improve the identification of network breaches. In 2013, he published the widely read book, Cyber War Will Not Take Place. You need to challenge him on that in the question and answer. He has testified on information security in front of the U.S. Senate Select Committee on Intelligence, as well as in the German Bundestag and the British Parliament. From 2011 to 2016, Dr. Ridd was professor in the Department of War Studies at King's College in London. Between 2003 and 2010, he worked at major think tanks in Berlin, Paris, Jerusalem, and Washington, D.C. Professor Ridd earned his Ph.D. from Humboldt University in Berlin. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Thomas Ridd. Thank you for this generous introduction. Let me now pull up my presentation here um, and present. All right. Um, I will speak today just briefly. Um, most of you, you had your dinner, and um, it's always a difficult spot to give the after dinner speech because many of you are thinking about the first drink and you know what to do this evening. So I'll be I'll be brief, and, and, and we'll have a lot of pictures. Can we pull up my presentation? Is this working? Yes, or maybe not. So I'll be speaking about the ethics of cyber attacks. But in order to have a vehicle to get across my observations on the ethics of cyber attack, I want to use an, an example, a case study of not just uh, any cyber attack. I'm getting hand signs from the back here. Uh, I want to use a case study uh, not just of any cyber attack, but the biggest, most devastating, most costly cyber attack that we experienced ever. Some of you may recognize this picture. Uh, it's the screen that uh, thousands and thousands of people saw last June, at the end of June 2017, first in Ukraine, but then across the, across the world. And the attack is known as the NotPetya attack. Can I just ask for a quick uh, sign? Who has heard of NotPetya before? About half of uh, the audience. Okay, that's a good sign. It's, uh, so I'll briefly tell the story of what happened in NotPetya and then extract a few uh, ethical considerations out of that operation. So NotPetya was a, an attack uh, that was a ransom, uh, looked like a ransomware attack. Uh, by the way, I was told you're a reasonably technical audience, so I'm not going to explain words like ran ransomware. Is that, a, is that okay? Okay, good. Um, so it's, it was camouflaged as a ransomware attack with a Bitcoin address so it, you know, it could pay and, and get your files back because they were encrypted. But in fact, as soon became clear, it really wasn't a ransomware attack because there was no way to get the files back. So for example, that, that email address here, where is it? Here? Very quickly was, didn't work. Uh, it was, became clear that the email address was deactivated. Um, and, uh, and more importantly, it very quickly became clear that the decryption, decryption actually with a small limitation, but decryption didn't work. So what we had here, very quickly, day after, uh, day after the operation started, 
and this is how it looked like in practice. This is a supermarket on the morning of that day in Ukraine. You know, it stopped uh, much of the country for a day or more, actually. Um, the, um, the operation was basically a wiping attack, an attack designed to delete files that operated through encryption. So very, a very innovative, uh, creative, and kind of scary thing. So let's have a close-up look at what happened. Um, here's another example. I mean, it was really all over the place in Ukraine. And um, have a quick uh, a look at how it, how it operated, the, the, the attack. Every company in Ukraine, as you would expect, has to report taxes, pay taxes. Uh, in order to pay taxes in Ukraine, they have to use a software uh, that is in order to, you know, do their tax return. So every small company, small and large company in Ukraine, including these supermarkets, including banks, you saw the ATM machine, including, you know, the airport, have to uh, use the software. This is the tax reporting software called Medoc. So whoever designed not Petya, had this idea, well, we can use Medoc. Me it's practically a thick, fat, red target cross on Ukraine because it's only used in Ukraine, the software. So if we limit our wiping attack um, against users of Medoc, we basically have a Ukrainian business target uh, you know, nicely contained. So that's what they did. Um, the uh, operation in Ukraine was very effective 10% from a Ukraine, Ukrainian newspaper, 10% from the presidential administration is the source. 10% of all machines in Ukraine, a country of 42 million people, were affected. This is extraordinary. We've never seen anything like it. This is uh, the, the Ukrainian police raiding the offices of Medoc, of that tax company. Um, but it soon came out that the that the, uh, the tool, the NotPetya attack tool, had files, exploits built into it that had been leaked from the NSA. One of them was Eternal Blue. This is my amateurish attempt to visualize Eternal Blue for you here. <laughs> uh, another one, easier to visualize, called Eternal Romance. You know, the NSA has funny code names sometimes. These two exploits were had been leaked, and with a high level of certainty, we know they're actually genuine exploits from NSA. They'd already been patched, but not everywhere, uh, in Microsoft Windows. And, um, and it worked. It worked too well. So what happened next is not just 10% of all machines in Ukraine uh, were hit, but approximately 7,000 companies. Uh, it's actually really difficult to, to estimate the number but a very large number of companies worldwide. So for example, Maersk, a Danish logistics firm that is responsible for one in seven containers globally. They're really a critical part of the world economy. They were hit, and um, NotPetya caused damages of approximately 300 million, 250 to 300 million for them. Um, a company, um, I forget their name, the, their products are better known than their name, they have a very long name, but the company that produces a, a, a number of cleaning uh, hygiene products, including Durex condoms, was hit, and the production of these products was hit, uh, was down for, or at least degraded for two weeks. I mean, that is how serious the attack was. Merck, the American, American pharmaceutical company, was hit a uh, damage of 300 million. In total, NotPetya caused a damage of in, well into the billions. Uh, TNT or FedEx, FedEx subsidiary was hit very badly, and um, it, it could have been the end of that company had it not had the backing of FedEx. That is how bad the attack was. Now, just about when was it? A week or 10 days ago? The White House, uh, as well as the United Kingdom, so the United States, the United Kingdom, Australia, the Five Eyes community, as well as Denmark uh, and Estonia and a few uh, other small countries in Europe called out Russian military intelligence for being behind that operation. So we have here the, the most brazen and aggressive cyber attack on record in my mind. I think that that's not an overstatement. Uh, attributed by the US government and others to the 
uh, Russian uh, military intelligence. This is uh, probably wasn't that wasn't the dev the dev team, but you know I needed a picture here. <laughs> but it gets more interesting. The operation also hit Russian companies, so you had um, Rosneft, uh, an energy company, hit. You had Gazprom hit in Russia. Uh, so it appears that somebody at GRU made a mistake because the spreading mechanism, the eternal blue and other internal, uh, other spreading mechanisms that they built into the software. Basically, all of these companies, including the Russian companies, used Madoc for their taxes. But once the uh, worm was inside the network, it spread globally within a company network, bringing down entire company networks. So what we have here, you know, in classical terms is collateral damage. And uh, probably the developer of, of NotPetya did not anticipate collateral damage globally, especially in Russia, to that extent. Or maybe they did. Because if we look closely at NotPetya, just to, to uh, a little bit of detail for those of you who followed the situation technically, Kaspersky antivirus uh, had an interesting role in this. In this. The, the NotPetya attack tool did not did execute it itself differently on machines that had Kaspersky antivirus installed, which is a really interesting detail. If Kaspersky antivirus was installed, it didn't actually uh, encrypt the entire master boot record, only the master file table, which meant the encryption was recoverable, which is an interesting little detail here that is hard to explain. Um, because clearly Kaspersky is also used in Ukraine. So it, it, it sort of is really a confusing detail. Uh, okay, let me draw some conclusions very quickly from this incident. And often when we draw conclusions, when we discuss um, even you know, modern uh, conflict, including cyber conflict, we by default revert back to Cold War Mind, into a Cold War mindset, and especially into a deterrence mindset. Uh, so the deterrence discussion, cyber deterrence, is, um, uh, is, 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 is still a very hot conversation in cybersecurity circles. But I, I, I would posit, I would argue tonight, just to prov maybe provoke a discussion, that we're in, here we're looking not at symmetrical rules, not at symmetrical, if you like, also ethical considerations. Deterrence, by definition, nuclear deterrence, is a symmetrical confrontation. You know, mutually assured destruction, whatever paradigm you want to take, is a symmetrical situation. You do, uh, the adversaries have a, have a, have a balance of, uh, of deterrence going on. But here, if we look at NotPetya more closely, there is no balance. So I would suggest to use a very different mindset. I would suggest we take the NotPetya operation and view it in a tradition of operations that we describe as active measures. Uh, an old Cold War intelligence term of art, active measures are disinformation operations, deception operations that are designed, sometimes leaks, that are designed to really throw a wrench into the larger machine that is your adversary. And we've seen that throughout the Cold War uh, you know, there was no, no use of nuclear weapons throughout the Cold War, but active measures happened literally on a weekly basis. It was an ongoing grind. It happened largely in, in the shadows. So not Petya, and indeed think of the election interference in 2016 in the United States. These operations have hallmarks of active measures, and I would just point out three and argue that we're looking at an asymmetrical ethical situation here. First, they are different. What they do to us, they being here an authoritarian country, Russia has um, engaged in active measures for a very long period of time. They basically play according to different rules. We can't do to them what they do to us. Because if we do to them what they, what, if we do to them what they do to us, we lose our fee, the, the a core aspect of you know, what we are as liberal, open democracies. For example, they target indiscriminately, although the MEDOC question is, you know, uh, is it really completely indiscriminate or not? But the White House called 
this operation indiscriminate? Indiscriminate also because it targets private entities, private sector companies at scale. That's something that I think we don't want to do in response to an attack like this. It would not be okay for the UK or for the United States to target you know, private sector companies, uh, certainly not globally, in the same way. So a different rule set. Secondly, I think we also don't want to deceive and play the disinformation game at the same level. They deceive, deny, and disinform at scale on a strategic level. Yes, of course, in some military conflicts, we may engage in some tactical deception that's been part of military operations for a very long time, but not on a strategic, on a societal, political level. I'll, I'll just you know, provoke you. When I hear an intelligence estimate by, say, you know, an intelligence agency or the joint, a joint intelligence estimate here in the US by the DNI, then I take that intelligence estimate extremely seriously because I know how much work goes into producing an intelligence estimate like that. So it makes a, you know, the US intelligence community has a lot of credibility if they communicate properly. Were CIA, for example, or others engaged in disinformation operations on a strategic level at scale, in essentially lying at scale, would I still trust their intelligence assessment in the same way? I think we should resist the temptation to sort of enter the disinformation game in the same way that the adversary is doing it right now. And finally, um, um, there's the question of driving wedges, the third point that I wanted to highlight. Active measures are designed to exacerbate existing cracks in our political system. And I think we've seen this in 2016, that they try, that active measures try to drive wedges between, you know, even between, between different between different parties or fractions within the Democratic Party. Bernie Sanders supporters versus Hillary Clinton supporters. We saw that during the Democratic Convention on the 25th of July 2016, directly targeted through an active measure. Do we really want to be in the same business of driving wedges and attacking open societies, which are by definition more vulnerable? I would argue if we do so, we're entering uh, a very dangerous, uh, treacherous terrain that, as I said, turns us into something that we don't want to be. Um, that just as a provocation, basically the take home message is, we analyze cyber attacks as a form of active measures, then we're looking at asymmetric ethical rules that, and I would argue that this is a, a strength of open democracies, limit the kind of tactics that we want to and that we should engage in. I think we have time for just a few minutes for questions, and I would love to uh, engage. Thank you. Thank you. So I think we don't have a mic for you in the room, but I can, we'll just repeat the question. So if somebody wants, wants to ask a question, sir, just project and I will repeat the question. So the question is whether I see a situation where we could, where a, a kinetic response to a cyber attack would be appropriate. Um, I mean, so far we haven't, seen, we haven't seen a situation where that would be appropriate. And as I said, NotPetya was one of the most uh, uh, devastating attacks so far. It's certainly thinkable, uh, especially a very high profile attack against the uh, critical, elect um, the grid, for example, in this country or really another country as well. But this could reach a level of severity, of pain that would, um, uh, that where a kinetic response could, would begin to be an option. But I think we've, we haven't been there before. And let's just also uh, this make this concrete. The United States shared information about NotPetya uh, on the attribution of NotPetya with its allies in the past week. Some of these allies, some of them important large countries like Germany and France, did not want to come along with the attribution statement. And that is, of course, a crack 
there within, like, that goes right through NATO. So I think we really need to get our political house and our game in order as an, as an alliance um, as well I before we can even talk about kinetic, kinetic responses. Um, it's very, very difficult to actually do in practice if you, don't, if you can't even get the attribution um, right in a credible way. Sorry, I'm kind of partly dodging your, your question here. Um, yes, sir. You, right there, you, you just waved your hand, yeah? There's no mic, I'm sorry. There is a mic now, could you use it? For creating t such tools and hoarding such tools in the first place instead of publicly releasing. Why has, who held the NSA? So why has the press and the media and no one held the NSA accountable for creating and holding on to such vulnerabilities exploits? I mean, people have tried to hold, I mean, you know, the NSA is a technical intelligence agency. Encryption by default is becoming a very, very significant problem for intelligence, for signals intelligence agencies. Basically means you can't stick an antenna into the air and intercept traffic in the same way that was possible for most of the Cold War. You now have to hack the endpoints, not the midpoint of a conversation. Endpoints being, you know, Ben's phone that he's looking at right now. <laughs> and he knows my talk, so, you know, I don't blame him. But, uh, um, but if you hack endpoints, you have to do that somehow, right? You need these exploits. If we want to continue to have a potent intelligence agency, then you know, they need some exploits, I guess. So it's a very difficult conversation to have about what kind of exploits to make public and to have patched and what exploits not to have patched. I'll, I'll just provoke some of you in the room who sort of default into blaming, for example, the NSA for keeping some systems vulnerable. A lot of countries right now, a lot of countries right now inv are investing a very significant amount of resources and money into signals intelligence, into building up. They basically so saw the Snowden files, China, Russia, Snowden leaks, and they thought, oh my God, I want one of those as well. One of those powerful agencies that can, you know, do mass, quote unquote, mass surveillance. So that raises a very difficult question for all of us. Do we want the most potent signals intelligence agency to be in an open liberal democracy or not? And if so, how do we do that without compromising our own civil liberties? That's an extremely difficult question. We shouldn't pretend it's an easy question. Yes, sir, there in the back. Hi, my name is Brian McGuire. Um, so how do you feel, like, how, how will non-state actors play a role in the coming future as they don't obey some of these ethical rules, I guess you would say, or these um, mutually assured destruction worries as larger competitors of the United States like Russia and China do? Non-state, how, the, the, how do, what about non-state actors here? Um, Non, the, the question of non-state actors is a, is a difficult one because non-state actors presumably include companies in the private sector as well as you know terrorist militant organizations and whatnot. Um, so I would just point out that capabilities in 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 this uh, high-tech uh, digital conflict situation here are very unevenly distributed. You often hear that hear that uh, notion that technology democratizes offensive capabilities. And I'm not sure I completely buy into that because if we look at the most crucial uh, capabilities, abilities that you need, a highly innovative intelligence community, um, and also attribution capabilities, you, know, you need to know who attacked you. And attributing sophisticated attacks is actually, you know, it requires resources, it requires commitment, it requires skills requires a lot of people. Um, so what I see, I think, is actually a more uneven distribution of capabilities than we've seen, for example, in some other uh, weapon, for some other weapon systems. So make, let's make an example. If Saudi Arabia gets attacked, which happened in 2012 with Shamoon, um, some, uh, some, uh, as some of you will know, 
for they had a real difficulty um, responding and attributing this, this attack. And they needed to call in companies from Europe and from the United States in order to help them. So I think, you know, counterintuitively, the private sector here will have a role in, 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 shi in shipping capabilities on demand to a specific victim to be able to respond both defensively and I think sometimes also offensively. Uh, Uh, Austin Strand, Marymount University. So how do groups, or how does the existence of groups like Anonymous and like other troll hackers out there complicate this picture? Oh, that's a fun question. <laughs> yeah, it complicates it a lot. It complicates it for one overarching reason that, um, that is really very unpleasant. And that is that we've, what we've seen over the past I think it began in, a, in around 2014, is that state actors are camouflaging, actually it began probably earlier, 2012, state actors begin to camouflage as activists. Uh, the most prominent example is obviously some, is uh, Julian Assange and WikiLeaks, you know, being used and exploited probably unwittingly. Um, maybe not unwittingly difficult to say, but let's give them the, the benefit of the doubt. We have so many other examples. Uh, you know, the Shamoon attack that I just mentioned in Saudi Arabia that was allegedly the cutting sword of justice, some activist group. Uh, more likely it was Iran, but it's difficult to say. Um, uh, one group that doesn't get a lot of press is called Shaltai Baltai in Russian, or Humpty Dumpty in English. It's a hacking group that bills itself as Anonymous International that have delivered high-profile attacks against Kremlin targets consistently over the years. High-profile leaks of Kremlin aids to Putin. Uh, very embarrassing for these people that, you know, they have operated, uh, they, they pulled off major operations uh, over the past, since 2014. Uh, who is behind Shaltai Baltai? Is it actually an activist group? We don't know. But there's a lot going on if you start looking more closely. So I would just basically take your question to caution what is, you know, what is an activist, what are activists? You can even go back way into the Cold War where you had, uh, in fact, agencies on, bon on both sides um, camouflaging as activists and indeed exploiting genuine passions. That in itself, I think that to me is one of the most fascinating aspects. Activists operate on, on passion, you know, Think of the anti-nuclear movement in the, in the early 1980s. Soviets were very skilled at exploiting genuine passions, uh, just like some WikiLeaks supporters uh, today don't understand that they're actually supporting a, a, an authoritarian regime at the same time. Um, excellent. I think we... Can somebody give me a sign whether we still have time for another question or whether... One more? Hi, Susan Conrad from Marymount University. So given that uh, hackbacks is probably something we would consider unethical, and given that we have uh, proxy, proxy non-state actors in the uh, arena here, what global laws and penalties and enforcement agencies should there be to be able to put some kind of equilibrium in this you know, this area of cyber, cyber terror, cyber war, cyber whatever you want to call it. Um, so, you know, when we call it, most operations, I, I'm, the kind of school that I represent, that Benrick presents, you know, cyber conflict, if you want to call it cyber conflict, or just computer network intrusions, have been happening for around 25 years now. It's not, a, it's not a new thing. So we shouldn't all treat it like a new thing. We can study a history here. We can study an entire universe of case studies. And if we look at that universe of case studies, what we see is often, is, is basically mostly espionage. It's mostly intelligence operations, often commercial espionage. And the, the exception is our operations that would fall into, the, into sort of you know, a conventional military framework. 
we really struggled to come up even with a single example that was executed by a military, uh, by sort of a military on military type cyber attack. It's extremely rare. It may happen in the future, but so far it's rare. So what does that mean in response to your question? It means, in my mind, that these operations tend to be covert or semi-covert, deniable, and you know, perpetrators almost always deny them, even against uh, convincing evidence. So that makes it extremely difficult to enforce any rules because they will simply say, oh, that wasn't us. I mean, I, mean, I, I saw that just uh, last week in Munich where we had a Russian official who simply basically, you know, made fun of the NSA because of eternal blue and eternal romance on a panel, a Russian official, and then completely denied that um, Russia was behind NotPetya. You know, they get away with it. So it makes it hard to enforce rules. Just a very quick response on hackback, because sometimes that's a popular sort of response. People say, well, they hack us, we want to hack them back and recover our files or something. If your company or even your organization fails at the defense, why should they succeed at the offense? <laughs> because actually the offense is harder than the defense. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Oh, okay. Dr. Red, thanks for some great uh, insights into what is a very, very current and relevant problem and some great questions and discussions and we look forward to you. Uh, having you back. Appreciate Thank you very much. Thank you much. so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.